I'll never forget the birth of our first child. Uh, we were a young couple in, in our mid-twenties. We were living away from her family, living away from my family, living in a, a little two-room duplex apartment. And the labor started at midnight. Isn't that when babies always come? And so Melissa says, hey, baby, it's time to go. So I loaded her up in the car. We were driving with anxiety in our hearts and our minds down to the Erlanger Hospital in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Labor all through the night, midnight, about 6.30 the next morning. We were there in the delivery room. I had on my beautiful blue gown and the little blue hat. Uh, and the doctor who delivered this baby calls me over with a pair of scissors, and I actually get to cut the cord and hold my little baby boy, Caleb, for the very first time a week later. An amazing moment. We were so excited. We just couldn't wait to get that boy home. We stayed in the hospital for a couple of days. He was uh, very jaundiced, and so just kind of resting up and and Melissa was healing up, and he was getting adjusted to being in this new world. And then they came to us and said, man, now it's time. It's time for you to load this little baby boy up and take him home. And we said, wait, what? We're not ready yet. We feel like we need to stay here just a couple more days. And they said, no, no, it's time. And so we put him in the car seat for the first time. I drove so cautiously home, you know, about 35 miles per hour. We got him home, and uh, there was a home health nurse that met us there because he was a re really jaundiced, kind of yellow. And, and so she came with a, a little clear plastic incubator put in his bedroom, and she put these blinders over his eyes, and he was completely naked. And she lays this little boy in there with the blinders over his eyes in the incubator with the blue lights on. He kind of curls up. He looked like an alien from a distance. We said, wait, is that our kid? I mean, is that our baby? And Caleb cried, and Melissa cried, and, and I cried, and we all cried. Because all of that energy and excitement that we felt during the pregnancy and the delivery and the hospital, now it turned into a little bit of fear, just to be honest with you. He finally settles in. We try to get to sleep, and neither one of us can sleep. I'm just so anxious. Every time things get really quiet, tiptoe across the hallway, and I would look at him from a distance, and just to be sure, I would walk over to that little incubator, and I would take my two fingers and reach inside and lay them ever so gently on his chest and watch him breathe, rise and fall, and rise and fall, because there was something down deep inside of both of us that caused us to be fearful that we wouldn't make it through the first night. Anybody in this room relate to this story? I can only imagine that these feelings of fear and, and uncertainty were, were magnified a hundred times over in the hearts of Joseph and Mary, the soon-to-be parents of Jesus, the Savior of the world. And today, as we walk in week two of this message series called Fear Less, I want to revisit this very familiar Christmas story in a new light of how the God of creation sent an angel to speak into the hearts of this father and this mother and even the shepherds on the hillside to say, Fear Less. Before we dig into the Word together, let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for the sweetness of our time of worship today. Lord, we know that your Word teaches us that you dwell within, you inhabit the praise of your children. We know that you are right here in our midst. And Father, I, I just thank you for this storyline today that we've heard since we were little children of, of Joseph and Mary and the birth of Jesus but I pray today, Holy Spirit, that you would be our teacher, you would be our guide, that the written words of the Bible would jump off the page and penetrate the deep recesses of our minds and our hearts. God, I pray that today this place would be a place of healing. Lord, I pray that Jesus, today you would change everything. Lord, I pray that we would walk out of here differently than the way we came in here. 
this morning. Father, we may not be fearless, but lead us to the place to where we fear less a little more today than we did the day before. We ask now, Lord, that you do a mighty work in us so that you could do a mighty work through us. Move in our midst, we pray, Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to begin by looking at the story of this father, Joseph. We find his storyline in Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to pick up together at verse number 18. You can track along in a hard copy of the Bible or on your phone or your iPad or on either of the big screens at all of our campuses today. And so we look in the life of Joseph, and in Matthew chapter 1, verse number 18, the Word of God says, This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, in other words, before they were intimate with one another, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Verse 19. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. Let me time out here. What does this mean, that Joseph was faithful to the law? He was a devout young Jewish boy, and he knew the Old Testament Levitical law. When a young man and a young woman were betrothed to be together, they were engaged to be together in marriage, it was like they were already married in culture's eye. And so if one of these two were unfaithful to the other, Joseph had the right to take her to public court and to shame her and to disgrace her and to embarrass her. He even had the right, according to the book of Leviticus, to have her carried outside the city walls and stoned to death. But Joseph, being a man of compassion and love for Mary and a love for the Lord, although he was obedient and faithful to the law, and yet he did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. What a godly man. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. If you would look at verse 20 on the big screen right now. And Joseph, son of David, say this with me out loud, do not be to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And he said, it sure better be. So Joseph, you know, this has got to be running through his mind. And man, this is the love of my life. We've been together all these years. I've committed myself to her. She's committed herself to me. And I'm so anxious in this moment. But God sends an angel from glory. And he says and he whispers into the heart and the ear of David, David, do not be afraid. And this is not an optional thing here. He's saying, hey, David, uh, I mean, hey, Joseph, by the way, I don't want you to worry about this. He's giving him a command. He says, do not be afraid. It's the Greek word phobeo, P-H-O-E-B-O, phobeo. And the word literally means to put to flight or to be seized by fear. You know, when you get afraid, the world tells us that you either have fight or flight. I don't know which one you are when you get afraid. I mean, do you tell and run or, or do you stand up and you're ready to punch somebody in the throat? I don't know which one's you. But most of us will have this tendency, one or the other, to fight or flight. But the angel says to Joseph, do not be afraid. Phobeo is where we get the English word phobia from. I'm not sure if you have any phobias in here. Are you, are you fearful of the dark? Are you feel fearful of close spaces? Are you claustrophobic? Are you fearful of, of spiders, things with eight legs? Maybe you have a phobia. Well, the angel says to Joseph, do not be afraid. Phobeo. Don't have a phobia about this. And so, so this word phobeo literally means to put in flight, to call you to run away in fear or to be seized by fear. Fear can be paralyzing, can it not? I mean, you can be so afraid that you just are paralyzed in the moment. But the angel of the Lord comes to Joseph, the father of Jesus, the espoused husband-to-be of Mary, and he says, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, 
and you are to give him the name Jesus. Don't you love the name Jesus? It literally means the Lord saves. Jesus, the Lord saves. Because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet Isaiah, verse 23. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us, out of Isaiah 7, 14. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. Now watch this. And he gave him the name Jesus. This may seem insignificant to men and women in the room, but this is a big deal for Joseph because in Jewish culture, every father maintained the right to name their own baby boy. I imagine Joseph from a teenager thought, man, one day I will find the love of my life. One day I'll be a spouse to be married. One day we'll be engaged. One day we'll be married. One day maybe God will bless us with a child, and maybe it'll be a boy. And if I ever have a boy, I'm going to name him. And he has this special name picked out because every Jewish man always loved and desired the right to name their own baby boy. But the Spirit of the Lord had said to Joseph, and you will call his name Jesus, the Savior of the world. And so Joseph, what an amazing man at this time. What, what a brave, spirit-filled, obedient husband and faithful father and submissive servant of God. He laid down his own rights. He, he faced public ridicule, rejection of his family to honor the Lord, to honor his bride. He faced his greatest fears to be able to bless his son, Jesus. Because the angel said, do not be afraid. Hey, men in the room today, look at me. What are you afraid of? Let's just be real today and honest, transparent with one another. If you were just honest with yourself and God today, what are you afraid of? What causes you to have sleepless nights? What, what wakes you up early in the morning? What makes your heart race a little faster? What makes your mind spin out of control? What, what are you afraid of today? If we could just be real with one another. Maybe you're here for the sole purpose of addressing this anxiety, this stress, this fear, this brokenness within you. Maybe you're here today because God wants to begin a brand new journey with you, that God wants to birth something brand new in your mind or your heart today. What are you afraid of? Could you write it down? Have you talked to the Father about it? Have you begun to walk in this with a friend? What are you afraid of? Let's change gears. And we leave the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1 and we turn over to the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. And now I want to leave the heart and the storyline of Joseph, the father of Jesus. And I want to talk for a moment about Mary, the, the mother of Jesus. In Luke chapter 1, pick up with me, if you will, at verse number 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, this is Mary's cousin, the mother of John the Baptist, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now notice verse 29. Mary was greatly troubled at his words. She was greatly troubled. This is a significant word. I want you to circle or highlight or underline the word troubled in your Bible, right in your sermon notebook or your journal today. This word trouble is the Greek word tarasso, T-A-R-A-S-S-O. And tarasso literally means to be agitated or to churn. 
when I was a little boy, I was always so curious as to what made things work. One time I took my mother's upright piano apart. It never worked again. I got in big trouble. But I was intrigued by my, my mother's washing machine. I don't know why she would put the laundry in and the detergent in, and she would turn it on, and she would close the lid. And I could not see inside, but I could hear the water churning. You know the sound, right? It's that shh, 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 shh. I thought, what is in there? What makes the water go shh? And so I was so curious that I waited till my mom to get in the back side of the house. I slipped into her little laundry room, and I heard the laundry swishing inside of the washing machine. And so I sneaked up, and I took a hold of a lid. But when I opened the lid, it stopped. I was in quite a dilemma here. I would close the lid. It was shh, shh, shh. I would open the lid. It would stop. It's kind of like, you know, trying to open the refrigerator door fast enough to see if the light's still on. You know, you've been there, right? Is this just me here? Thank you, Anthony. Got one real brother here. The rest of you all telling a lie. So I devised a plan. I realized as a young boy, my pinky finger was small enough to squeeze down in the hole to depress the switch that made the washing machine swish and swash. So I opened the lid, I took my pinky finger, and I depressed the button, and sure enough, it started doing its thing. The water, the soap, the clothes, and I looked down deep inside, and in the bottom of the washing machine, there was a large plastic blade that was churning back and forth and back and forth. It was agitating the clothes. You know what that's called, right? It's called a... An agitator. You guys are sharp. It's called an agitator. It's agitating the water. It's agitating the soap. It's agitating the clothing. It's knocking the dirt out of the soiled garment. It's churning down deep inside. And this is exactly what was going on in the heart of Mary the mother of Jesus, she heard the word from the angel, but the Bible says that she was deeply troubled down deep in her heart, a terrasso moment. She was turning on the inside. Ma'am, maybe that's exactly where you are today. And you came in looking amazing, and you've got this sweet countenance on your face. And you smiled and you sang and maybe even lifted your hand in worship. But if you were completely truthful and honest with yourself and with God, there's something churning down deep inside of your soul. You ever have a spiritual churning in your soul? And it causes you to be afraid. This is where Mary is. Mary was greatly troubled, terrasso, agitated, churning from the inside out at the words. And she wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Look at the screen in verse number 30 and help me out. But the angel said to her, do not be Guess what word this is? Obeo. It's the exact same word that the angel spoke to Joseph. Maybe it's the same angel. We don't know. It doesn't name the angel in Joseph's life. It names the angel Gabriel, the angel of announcement here in Mary's life. But here's what I have discovered after 35 years of marriage. Anything that the Spirit of God will speak into my heart and my life, He will always take the time to confirm in the heart of my bride. Oh, anything that God would speak into the heart of my wife, 
God would always take the time to confirm it in my heart. We have never made major decisions in our life, in our marriage, our finances, our children, our calling, our ministry, until God had confirmed it deeply in both of our hearts. And so God, trying to confirm this miracle in the life of Joseph and Mary, sends the angel to say to Joseph, do not be afraid. Don't be phobic about this. Don't be agitated in your soul. Mary, don't be afraid. It's me. I'm in this. I'm doing this thing in you. I'm birthing something new in you. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus, and he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. This is an Old Testament fulfillment of prophecy that the Messiah would come out of the family line or lineage of King David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. And his kingdom will never end. Look at verse 34. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since, since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered, watch this, so powerful. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power, Greek word dunamis, where we get the word dynamite, same word that's used in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, and you shall receive power, dunamis, after the Holy Spirit has come on you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. The Holy Spirit will come on you with power of the Most High will over shadow you. I love this word. Ladies, men, would you just circle the word overshadow in your Bible? It literally means in the original manuscript to shade or to envelop. To shade or to envelop. It's the same train of thought that we discover in the Old Testament where the Holy Spirit of God, the presence of God Himself, the Shekinah glory, the cloud of God would come down from heaven and would settle on the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. God would say, don't move the tent, don't move a thing. I am settling down in your presence. The glory of God is in this place. He would shade the tabernacle. He would overshadow the tabernacle. He would envelop the tabernacle with His presence. It's the same exact train of thought as we move into the New Testament and Jesus takes His inner circle of Peter, James, and John up on the mountain of transfiguration. And there with Elijah and Moses, He is overshadowed with the glory cloud of God. He is enveloped in the Holy Spirit of God to when they look at Him, He's glowing with the power and the majesty and the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit. This is the very same thing that he's saying to Mary in this moment as she's filled full of anxiety, of stress and fear, and she's greatly troubled. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Mary, in this moment where you are absolutely overwhelmed and undone, I'm going to envelop you with my spirit. Is that good news or what? I'm going to envelop you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Verse 37, he says, For no word from God will ever fail. Amen? Is that true or what? Verse 38, Mary says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. What an amazing young teenage girl. Probably 14, 15, 16 years of age at this time in her life. Filled with great faith in her God. She was willing to walk away from her family. Walk away from her home. Walk away from security. Walk away. Risk great reputation. Face shame. Fear, embarrassment, to trust God fully with it all. Ladies in the room today, moms, grandparents, aunts, 
college student, teenagers, single mom. Don't be afraid of that. What are you afraid of today? If you were just real and honest and transparent with yourself and God, what keeps you up at night? What wakes you up early in the morning? What fills your heart with anxiety? What makes your mind race? What are you afraid of? We've looked at the story of Joseph, the father. We've examined the storyline of Mary, the mother of Jesus. But can we kind of take this final little piece with the shepherds on the hillside? Turn your Bible over one chapter to Luke chapter 2. This is the famous chapter we read together as a family and as a church every Christmas. The Christmas story of Luke 2, verse 1. It reminds us that in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. In verse 4, it talks about Joseph and Mary going down to Nazareth, his hometown. In verse 6, it says, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. Now watch this unfold in verse 8 and following. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Look at the screen in verse number 10 and help me out once again. But the angel said to them, do not be so bad. Don't panic. Don't run in fear. Don't freeze up. Same word to Joseph, same word to Mary, same word to the shepherds. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all of the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. How many are thankful today that when the announcement came of the birth of the Messiah, it came to common men and women just like you and I. The angel didn't appear to a king or a prince or a president or a ruler or a governor. It came to common men, shepherd boys, keeping some dirty sheep out on the hillside. I want to wrap up our story today as we prepare to respond to the Lord. Just this one final verse. We come back full circle to Mary in Luke chapter 2 in verse 19. Watch this. So the angels came to the shepherds. The shepherds went to Joseph and Mary, found the baby lying in a manger, were in amazement, and they went away. But look at verse 19. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. This is the same young teenage girl who was terrified, agitated, fearful. Now experiencing a miracle from God and the words of the prophets and the angels being fulfilled in her midst. And the Bible says she treasured up all these things and pondered them in her mind. Have you ever received a word from God that you treasured? Hey, when you receive a real word from God, it's like a treasure. You hold on to that. You treasure it up. You you go back to it and you remember it day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. When you get a word from God, when you walk in a miracle of God, you see a fulfillment of prayer in your life, deliverance of an addiction, a stronghold, victory in any area of your life. You get a word from God. You treasure these things and you ponder them in your mind and this is exactly where Mary is. She's gone from being terrified and afraid 
to treasuring up a word from God in her heart and pondering these amazing thoughts in her mind. I just have to believe that the same God who spoke into the heart of Joseph and Mary is still the same God who's still on his throne, who's still sovereign, who's still in charge, who's still in control, who still has a plan for your life and a hope and a future for you. And today wants to take you from a place of being terrified and afraid to a place to where you hold on to the treasure of God in your heart and you ponder these amazing truths in your mind could that be you today and you walked in here this morning looking good but your mind racing with anxiety your heart and soul full of fear could today God speak a word into your heart that you would hold on to with everything in you wow What an amazing story. Joseph's story, Mary's story, the shepherd's story. But what about your story? What what about your story today? What about yours? What what does God want to birth in you today? What does God want to bring about fresh and new in you today? You, You can close your Bibles up in your sermon notebooks. But could you give me a moment just to walk with you and ask us a couple of pertinent questions, if I may? And here they are. What do you sense that God is trying to birth in you and through you today? Do you believe, do you sense that God is doing something new in you, in your mind, in your heart, in your life? What is it that you sense that God desires to birth in you or through you today? Maybe great faith for the very first time. Maybe a ministry opportunity that's on the horizon. Maybe it's a new calling in your life. Maybe it's a new relationship that the Lord wants to establish. Maybe it's a God-sized dream or a vision down deep in your heart that you sense that God is birthing something new in you, breathing new life into you, giving you boldness and faith and courage like never before? Could you write it down on a piece of paper today? Could you articulate it to someone else? What do you believe, what do you sense God is up to in your life this morning? What is God trying to birth in you or through you today? And then the second question, what are you afraid of? Are you afraid of your past? I used to be afraid of my past. I used to think the things that I'd done in my past was going to hinder what God wanted to do in my future. What are you afraid of today? Are you afraid of inadequacies? (laughs) Oh, my soul. Do I ever feel inadequate to do what I do every weekend? You guys have no idea. My whole life in ministry, I pray every week, and God, I am not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not sharp enough. God, I need your anointing. Holy Spirit, if you don't show up, I have nothing of worth or value to offer these sweet people. You're afraid of your inadequacies? I think everybody in the Bible was fearful of their inadequacies. Are you afraid of failure? I used to be so afraid of failure. Most of my life, I was afraid I was going to disappoint my parents. I was going to disappoint my coach. I was going to disappoint my wife. I was going to disappoint my children. I was going to disappoint my staff. I was going to disappoint my church. I just had this fear of failure. You ever had the fear of failure? Are you afraid of failure today? You can paralyze. You can't. Are, are, Are you fearful of embarrassment? Shame? Being found out, oh, man, if, if I say that, if I do that, if I walk in that, if I follow God with all my heart, they're going to see me. They're going to find me out. They're going to know the real me, that person I've been trying to hide and cover up all my life. They're going to see me. I'm going to be uncovered. I'm going to be found out. What are you afraid of today? Where this step of faith might lead you? Ever been afraid if, man, if I just trust God with all my heart, where's He going to send me? Where's He going to lead me? 
What you gonna ask me to do? Have you been afraid of that? What are you afraid of? You just real and honest with yourself today. Finally, will you like Joseph and Mary and the shepherds lay it all down? Trust God like never before. Face your biggest fears. Go for it. Just go for it. Could you come to the place in your life today for the first time or maybe the first time in a long time where you begin to see your life's biggest fears in the rearview mirror? Wouldn't it be good? That you could walk out of here today, maybe for the first time ever, maybe for the first time in a long time, where the biggest fears in your life are now behind you in your rearview mirror. You say, Pastor, wow, man, I, I love this series. I, I've just not come to the place where I can be fearless. And I'm going to say to you today, that's okay. I think God would say, yeah, that's okay. I think Jesus would say to you, that's okay. You, you've not come to the place yet in your life where you can say, man, bam, Boom, I've nailed it. I am fearless. I'm living life fearlessly. But could you come to the place in your life today to where you choose to fear a little less than you did this morning? Fear life a little less tomorrow than you did today. Fear a little less this week than you did last week. Fear a little less in October than you did in September. Fear a little less in 2020 than you did in 2019. I get it, and God gets it, and the Holy Spirit gets it, and Jesus gets it. If you're not in a place yet, sir, ma'am, college student, young person, where you can say, I'm fearless. But I think he wants to help you take the first step or the next step in your life to where you choose to fear less than you did the day before. I'm going to pray in just a moment, and then I want to invite you, if this word was for you, if the Spirit of God spoke into your mind or heart, if this resonated with you in any way, you sense God is in the process of birthing something brand new in you, and you're excited but you're anxious at the same time. Maybe today you came in and, man, your heart and your soul was agitated. It was churning inside of you. And God wants to deliver you from that anxiety and fear. Maybe you're that person that the Lord wants to allow to begin to see your greatest fears in the rearview mirror to lead you to the place where you fear less as you trust in Him.